In Climate Watch, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi attended the COP26 Climate Summit in Glasgow on Tuesday. During a news conference, she praised the Biden administration's Build Back Better plan and summarized its climate measures, despite there being no guarantees that the bill will pass the Senate in one piece. We come here uh, equipped, ready to take on the challenge, to meet the moment. We intend, uh, that is our plan, to pass the bill the week of November 15th, as is indicated in our uh, statements that were made at, at the time of passing the uh, infrastructure bill. And we're very proud of that. For more, I want to bring in Alice Hill. She is a senior fellow for energy and the environment at the Council on Foreign Relations. She also previously worked under the Obama administration. Alice, welcome. Thanks very much for being with us. As we await the social and climate spending plan at home, let's talk more about America's climate pledge on a global scale. What exactly has the U.S. promised? Well, the U.S. has come on with a very strong plan, among the strongest in the world. First, uh, we've promised that we will cut our emissions uh, by 50 to 52 percent from 2005 levels. That's our greenhouse gas pollution. We will also get to a clean energy grid by 2035, and then we will be net zero by 2050. Of course, the devil is in the details how we get there, but it is a very strong pledge and is perceived as a strong pledge by the rest of the world. Well, we've seen nine days of pledges from countries participating in COP26, but a new U.N. report says despite these pledges, the world is still likely to warm 2.5 degrees Celsius or 4.5 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. Why might these pledges not be enough? Well, that is a very disturbing report. Uh, part of the problem is it's hard to compare the pledges. Some are vague as to how they'll get there. And scientists have been very clear that we basically have only nine years left to get our emissions under control. So if countries push this out to 2050, we won't be keeping ourselves safe. There is a bit of good news that if we took all the pledges plus other pledges that have been made here about methane and deforestation here in Glasgow, we could get to 1.8 degrees Celsius. Well, remind us what would happen to the planet if it warms an extra 4.5 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, it almost sounds like science fiction. It is so scary. We will see unprecedented levels of heat. So the extreme heat waves, the types of heat waves that we saw this summer in the uh, Western United States will be five times more frequent. Some areas of the globe would be so hot during some periods, and this is in the Middle East and Africa, that it's unsafe to be outside for long periods of time. Death follows because the perspiration, you cannot perspire sufficiently to escape the heat in the very humid conditions. We'll also see wildfires, we'll see drought, uh, really cutting across wide swaths of the globe. And of course, after uh, drought, we see dry conditions that are conducive to wildfires. And then with climate change, it's often a story of too much water or too little water. And the too little water is the droughts. The too much water is like the flooding that we've seen in Europe this summer, in China, in the United States, but even more amounts of water. So it's a very grim picture, and that's why everyone is working so hard to avoid that calamitous future, uh, for which will hit across the planet. We, we've already seen a number of extreme weather events. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine those coming with even more frequency than they've been occurring already. Well, some climate activists have criticized the COP26 summit. Greta Thunberg called it a, quote, uh, PR event. So still, from what you've seen, has there been progress? Because we know there is, especially among young people, a great deal of dissatisfaction with how world leaders have handled this issue. Unquestionably, there's been progress. You know, coming into COP, the expectations were low, particularly given the change in geopolitical landscape uh, since the 
2015 convening in Paris, the Paris COP. But I think that this COP with the pledges for $130 trillion worth of assets that will align to net zero, that's from 450 different financial institutions. We've had this methane pledge that is the most damaging short term, but most damaging form of greenhouse gas pollution. Uh, that reduction will be 20, a uh, reduction by 30% by 2030, the deforestation ending by 2030. All of those pledges show far more project progress than we've been accustomed to in the past. So there's momentum here, but the youth are correct that it's not enough to get us to where we need to go. So we have a few more days here in COP for some very tough negotiations and the hope that is that those negotiations will yield even more progress. Well, Tuesday's summit theme focused on gender. Women are more vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Can you explain why? Absolutely. You know, women are, and girls are much more likely to die in disasters. And climate change brings a lot of disasters. There are a variety of reasons for that. In some cultures, women wear clothing that's not conducive simply to climb trees when it's flooding or get to higher ground. They're often responsible for taking care of children. They are home more, so they can't escape as easily. And then uh, when disaster strikes, they're often the last to eat. So we see stunting in young girls, also in young boys, but at higher rates among young girls. As we saw during the pandemic, girls uh, are sold off into child marriage when resources run short. Uh, they are also pulled out of school earlier. So all these impacts cascade and really hurt young women and girls and older women if climate impacts disasters strike. And that's why it's so important to focus on gender equality to make sure that women aren't paying a higher price for climate change. Well, fewer than 10 people at last week's gathering of world leaders were women. As a woman in this field, how important is representation in the climate policy making process? It's very important. Women's voices, just as the voices of the uh, disabled, people with disabilities, those that have been disadvantaged and marginalized through uh, redlining, for example, in the United States, they have to live in worse areas. All of these voices need to be heard for us to find the solutions that will work. And I think that the young people on the streets have been correct in calling for a brighter, broader range of voices to help make these decisions. I'm hoping that we'll see that uh, in the coming years, but we are running out of time and it's critical that we consider the needs of all people as we make plans for how to deal with this catastrophic future that climate change could bring. Alice Hill, Alice, thanks very much for joining us and sharing your perspective. Thanks so much, Elaine.